Okay, there we go. Um, for your information, today's session will be recorded. Uh, we will also be posting the information or the recording on our official website. So you can return to this if you have any questions later. Um, so let's get started. Here you're looking at the West Gate, the scenic West Gate of Peking University's campus, one of the most popular photography spots for tourists and visitors. If it, recalls to, if it calls to mind the palatial architecture of Beijing uh, and the Forbidden City, that makes sense because this area of campus used to be part of an imperial palace complex situated in the northwest of Beijing. Let me tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Brent Haas. I'm Associate Dean and Director of Admission Affairs at the Yanjing Academy of Peking University. <clears throat> Pardon me. I did my undergraduate work at Georgetown University in Washington, DC, majoring in history and minoring in Chinese. My master's and PhD are from the University of California, San Diego, uh, where I did, where I studied East Asian history. Um, are we having some technical problems? Can everyone hear me? Um, yes, uh, we can hear you, Brent. Please go ahead. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, so at University of California, San Diego, I studied modern Chinese history, uh, receiving two degrees in East Asian history. Now I've also been an international student studying in China twice in my undergraduate years, or just during undergraduate and just after. That was in 1999 at Princeton in Beijing Intensive Chinese Language Program at Beijing Normal University. And again, at the Inter-University Program for Chinese Language Studies at Tsinghua University in 2002 to 2003. For those of you old enough to remember, um, 0203 was the SARS uh, pandemic. And you know, so I was here during SARS and I'm here once again during the COVID-19 pandemic. I did my research um, on my dissertation at Qinghai Normal University in 2007 to 2008. And I've also been running study abroad programs for American universities in China for the last 11 years now. Um, including ones for Duke University, the University of California's system-wide education abroad program. And from 2015 to 2019, I came back to IUP as the resident director. So that's a little bit about me. So Peking University was founded in 1898. It is the oldest um, and most reputable of China's institutions of higher education. Obviously, we at, at PKU think it's the best as well, but I'll leave that debate up for others. Uh, you can see here another angle of the scenic Western Gate there. Lovely shots of some of the historical sites, some of the scenery on PKU's campus. In the upper left, you can see Tsai Yuanpei, one of the early presidents of Peking University and as well um, the Minister of Education for the Republic of China during the 19 teens and early 1920s. So studying and living on PKU's session on PKU's campus really is walking through some of uh, the most significant locations and being part of one of the most significant institutions in modern Chinese history. I'd like to draw your attention to the photograph in the middle upper portion of this slide. Um, this is Jingyuan. The Jingyuan grassy area is one of the older parts of PKU's campus. Um, it is where Yanjing Academy has our administrative and our classroom buildings. It's a lovely, lovely spot of campus. And in a city of roughly 20 million people, it's a, a rare treat indeed to be able to find a vista like Jingyuan where in almost 360 degrees around, you can't see a tall building poking over the trees. Um, Jingyuan was also part of the original campus of a university that was founded here in 1916 called Yanjing University. Yanjing University uh, was an American run Christian missionary school that at the time was trying to bring some of the best practices of Western liberal arts education to the developing Chinese higher education system. Peking University, although founded in 1898, was originally located closer into the center of the city, a little bit to the northeast of the Forbidden City within the old city walls or what is now the second ring road around Beijing's city center. 
1952, when Yanjing University closed, Peking University's campuses moved from the city, the center of the city, out to where we are now located. PKU now has um, over 11,500 faculty members divided into over 50 schools and departments, as well as 10 national key laboratories here on campus. These faculty uh, and staff serve over 46,000 <clears throat> full-time students, plus roughly 4,400 international students. So one of the advantages of being a Yanjing scholar is having the unparalleled support um, of Peking University's academic and administrative resources. So let's talk a little bit more about the Yenjing Academy, what this organization is, what this institution is, and what we're trying to achieve. First off, we are a study for, we are a center for graduate level study of China, its past, its present, and its changing role in the world. We are a two year fully funded academic master's program in China studies. Um, now, having run the admission cycle for several years now and gotten to know Yanjing scholars, both past and present, um, I can truly say that the young people who come join our program as Yanjing scholars are very, very impressive from different regions, different cultures, different walks of life, but all with a shared interest in the academic understanding of China and all truly exceptional. We're also part of a, a real wonderfully interesting grand experiment in bringing interdisciplinary educational and research methodology to the uh, Chinese system of graduate education. We'll talk a little bit more about that coming up later. And now this final talking point here, a catalyst for international dialogue. This may seem and sound a little bit insincere, but honestly, when you have people from all over the world with different levels of familiarity, with Chinese language, culture, history, politics, et cetera, interacting with the same professors, reading the same sources, discussing or debating the same topics, both inside the classroom, on campus, in the dormitory, wherever, it really does become a, a fascinating laboratory for international dialogue. Um, so I think that that is, though it sounds very talking pointy, it is very, very true. So we are a residential master's program. So for all first year students, you are required to live in the Yanjing Academy House, our dormitory on campus just for Yanjing scholars. For international students, you are not required to live on campus in your second year. If there are beds available, you are encouraged to apply. International students can uh, live off campus in Beijing in their second year, or if their research or internship um, requires it, they can be based in other parts of China or even uh, outside of China for their second year. Scholars from the Chinese mainland, from Hong Kong, Macau, and Taiwan, are required to be on campus for both of the two years of the Engine Academy um, program. English is the language of administration and education at the Yanjing Academy at Peking University. Now we are a China studies program. And so we have <clears throat> Chinese speakers, both from mainland China, from other Chinese uh, speaking areas in the world and international students who are capable if sometimes even fluent in Chinese. So there will be a lot of bilinguality uh, around campus at the Yanjing Academy, but courses are taught in English. <clears throat> and if you are not fluent in Chinese, that's okay, you are still eligible to apply. We offer our students the option and in many ways encourage our students to take courses outside of what just Yanjing Academy offers to further integrate into the broader academic and intellectual community of Peking University. And I'll tell you a little bit more about the details of the curriculum and the courses on offer coming up soon. Let's talk money, because um, at least in uh, North America um, and in er some areas around the world, finding a fully funded master's program is a major, major challenge indeed. So one of the benefits of becoming a Yanjing scholar is enjoying the financial support of the Yanjing Fellowship. This includes full tuition, housing, first year in the Yanjing Academy House, our on-campus dormitory, 
Um, a monthly stipend for living expenses, that monthly stipend is 3,000 renminbi or roughly 550, give or take, US dollars per month. It also includes one round trip travel stipend to and from your home city. Uh, in your first year, and basic medical insurance. And this medical insurance is specifically designed for international students who are living and studying in China. So basically, everything is taken care of in your first year. <clears throat> but let's talk about the second year, because we think this is a major investment we're making into young Yanjing scholars. And so it's very reasonable and understandable for the Yanjing Academy to conduct an academic performance review at the end of your first year. As soon as you enroll, you will find out the academic uh, standards that all first year scholars must meet. It'll, it'll include um, fulfilling a certain number of academic course credits in your first year, maintaining a certain minimum GPA, not failing any of your core required courses, not breaking our code of conduct or uh, the laws of the PRC, et cetera. If you meet those clearly outlined academic standards and apply for your second year fellowship, you will receive it. So you should consider this a fully funded two-year program with the qualification that you need to maintain uh, our standards of academic excellence in your first year. Now, for students who choose to live off campus in Beijing for their second year, uh, you will also receive a housing stipend for your second year. This housing stipend will be the same as a living expenses stipend, 3,000 renminbi per month. That's sufficient to cover a single room in a shared apartment around Beijing. It would be difficult, however, to find an apartment, a solo apartment in Beijing for 3,000 renminbi a month but many of our international students are excited about the opportunity to uh, integrate themselves into the broader uh, community of Beijing by living off campus in their second year. Now, Yanjing scholars, international Yanjing scholars in their second year can also apply to be based outside of China. And if that's the case, no problem. You can still be partially funded. You will receive your tuition, you will receive uh, your monthly living expense stipend. You will not receive uh, housing fund, uh, round trip travel, or basic medical insurance if you choose to be outside of China for the entirety of your second year in the program. Furthermore, in the second year, there are other funding opportunities available. These include teaching assistantships, research assistantships, office administrative assistantships, and residential advisor positions. These are granted on a competitive basis and look not only at your academic performance in the first year, but also at your broader contribution to the uh, uh, overall Yanjing Academy community. Okay, it's important that we talk a little bit about this. <clears throat> so, when you apply to the Yanjing Academy, you will need to choose one of our six research areas. Here you can see them listed on um, the slide before you. Today's research or today's information session is going to be focusing on economics and management. We've shared a link in the chat and we'll do so again later. You can also go to our website to see that we're going to be having five more open information sessions focused on individual uh, research areas at YCA. So let's talk about why this is important, how the research area works at Yanjing Academy, and then we'll focus in on economics and management. So these research areas will be important to your experience at YCA in three or four different ways. The first is in the application stage. So when you're applying, you will, since you're all here for an economics and management, um, information session, I'm going to mainly focus on that. When you apply, you will need to select China Studies, Economics and Management as your preferred research area. We are a highly competitive, fully funded graduate program in China Studies at a top university in China. So part of our evaluation process will be looking at your undergraduate or previous master's degrees, majors and minors, We'll be looking at your professional or internship experience, any perhaps research publications that you have done yourself or participated in, 
and your academic transcripts from all institutions of higher education that you've attended and graduated from in the past. The goal of evaluating your transcript and your academic and professional training is to ensure that you have the highest possibility for success conducting graduate level research at Peking University in the research field that you're applying for. So, you know, we will be looking if you're applying for economics and management, have you taken micro? Have you taken macroeconomics? Have you taken statistical analysis? Did you perhaps take courses on quality chain management or on HR or on institutional leadership, et cetera, et cetera? Do you have internships in investment banks or in, um, you know, um, as a financial analyst? Did you have internships, professional experience, say, in a consulting firm that helped international businesses? Uh, improve their operations, et cetera. So we're trying to make sure that um, not only are you a generally excellent student, but do you have the requisite training that will allow you the potential to be successful at the graduate level at Peking University and at the Yanjing Academy. So that's the first way that the research areas will be important to you in your application process. Now, let's say you maybe didn't major in economics no problem, but did you minor in it? Do you have courses that, that could help, you know, that can help assure us that you are well enough trained to conduct graduate research in economics and management? If you don't have an obvious, you know, undergraduate or previous, previous MBA or master's training that's gonna be, mm, make it clear to us as we review your applications, that you have the requisite training necessary for economics and management research, then you should anticipate that we're gonna have questions about that and try to address those questions in your application materials. Perhaps your statement, your personal statement, your, state, your statement of research interest, or even an additional document. So the second way that these research areas are important to you while you're at the Engineering Academy is when you're selecting a thesis advisor at the end of your first year. You will need to find an advisor whose work you are interested in, uh, who is also interested in your work and with whom you think you can work closely and can help guide you to the designing, carrying out, review, and writing of your master's thesis research project in your second year. In general, you're going to want a professor who is formally trained in, an expert in, one of the areas broadly defined as economics and management. So that's the second way your research area will be important to you while at YCA. The third way is in the thesis defense and graduation stage. At Peking University, you will need to complete your master's thesis, submit it to your thesis advisor, and upon your thesis advisor's approval, then you have an oral defense of your master's thesis with uh, three faculty members present. Once you pass the thesis defense, then your thesis will be submitted to two anonymous faculty reviewers at PKU. These two anonymous faculty reviewers will be drawn from departments or schools connected to economics and manage. It might be the economics department. It might be the Guanghua School of Management. It might be the School of National Development, et cetera. But in that, that final anonymous review stage, these professors who in theory don't know who you are will review your master's thesis as a document and they need to uh, agree that it makes an academic contribution uh, suitable for a master's level thesis or master's thesis and only then can you graduate. So that's why it's also important for you to have uh, good training in economics and management to try to set you up for passing your master's thesis and the anonymous faculty review stage. And then finally, on your diploma, it will say Peking University, Master of Economics, China Studies, Economics and Management. Or let's say if you uh, applied for history and archaeology, it would be Peking University, Master of History, China Studies, History and Archaeology. This is how we have been able to mm, fit interdisciplinary China Studies education and interdisciplinary China Studies research methodology into the degree granting uh, system of the Ministry of Education in the People's Republic of China. 
that's part of how interdisciplinary graduate studies and research is being integrated into the Chinese education system, that sort of grand experiment that I spoke about uh, early in my presentation. Okay, let's talk a little bit about our required curriculum. The courses that you see in the two, uh, the two rectangles at the top of the screen are our uh, core required courses. All first year Yanjing scholars will take these courses. China in Transition 1 and 2 is a two semester interdisciplinary look at contemporary China, really focusing on the beginning of the reform and opening period, so the late 1970s, early 1980s, up until today. China in Transition 1 is structured along the lines of large lectures or discussions. These lectures or discussions include one or more PKU faculty members combined with immediate breakout discussion sections after the, um, pardon me, <coughs> after the large lecture or seminar discussion takes place. So that fall semester, all Yanjing scholars will be taking this course. All Yanjing scholars will be in the lecture hall, whether it's virtual or in person, and then will be divided into smaller discussion sections. Um, China in Transition 2 in the spring semester of your first year um, is broken up into smaller courses. Um, these smaller courses trend towards one of the six research areas and students choose that course. And this course is designed to give all Yanjing scholars in their first year experience with faculty-led on the ground field research. So that is very important. Um, it's in, in essence to try to help you decide how, uh, help you learn how to conduct field research the year before you are responsible for designing and conducting your own field research for your master's thesis in year two. The field study is a very intense short um, one week or sometimes eight or nine day long course where students uh, under the guidance of Yanjing Academy leadership and faculty leave Beijing, go to another city and region in China and spend a long week visiting sites of um, archeological, historical, cultural significance, uh, interacting with, with local students and scholars, visiting businesses and industries and important cultural sites and getting a well-rounded understanding of a different city and region outside of Beijing. The goal of this course, which is required and graded, is to not only push learning outside of Beijing, but to push your learning outside of the classroom as well. Topics in China Studies Lecture Series brings in um, roughly 15 um, leading figures in different fields broadly under the umbrella of China Studies. They can be business leaders, academics, artists, media figures, etc to come and share their expertise and experience and then engage in discussion with Yanjing scholars. Then finally, academic writing requires, uh, is a requirement that brings in PKU faculty from different departments and schools to give lectures and discussions, giving you a um, guided step-by-step -step process for how to conceptualize, design, carry out, an independent research project, how to analyze your data, whatever form your data might be in, draft and write your master's thesis. So uh, on the required courses, all international students are required to take Chinese as a second language courses at the Engine Academy in their first year, unless an international student has completed and passed the HSK level six, the Han Yu Shui Ping Kao Shi, level six. If you pass out, if you already have a valid uh, HSK level six grade, you can be exempt from taking teaching Chinese as a second language courses, but you are still required to fulfill those course credits. And uh, we encourage and require students to take at least one course, content course, taught in other departments and schools at Peking University in Chinese. This is a very exciting opportunity for those who are extremely proficient, professionally proficient, perhaps fluent in Chinese, to learn Chinese, uh, to learn material in Chinese uh, with other Chinese students at Peking University, but it's a big challenge. Um, so that's, if you have an HSK 6, you can pass out of the Teaching Chinese as a Second Language course. 
For scholars from mainland China, Hong Kong, Macau, and Taiwan, you were also required to have a second foreign language, a non-English foreign language in your first year. For scholars from mainland China, you're required to have a politics course. At the bottom, you can see some general sort of uh, elective courses. These are not required, but they are also not specific to individual research areas like quantitative reasoning, critical thinking, and academic writing, leadership development as well. Those are some general courses that um, elective courses that Yanjing scholars have enjoyed taking in the past. Here you can see some of the elective courses that are offered uh, to um, Yanjing scholars in the broadly defined the economics and research, economics and management research track. I need to stress here, you are not, if you apply and are accepted into economics and management, you do not have to only take courses, elective courses within economics and or management. Um, as long as you and your faculty advisor, that is your first year academic advisor, not necessarily your thesis advisor, as long as you and your uh, first year um, academic advisor think that this course is not only interesting to you, but is necessary uh, to help train you for a portion of your second year master's thesis, then you are welcome to take those courses. But here are some of the courses on the left offered by Yanjing Academy affiliated faculty. Um, and then on the right, some of the courses that are offered by PKU faculty in other departments and schools. These are all offered in English. Again, if you are a native Chinese speaker, you can take courses taught in Chinese in other departments and schools. Or if you're a non-native speaker with an HSK 6, you can then um, also take some courses in content courses taught in Chinese. A um, couple of questions popping up on, um, on language for non-native speakers. Uh, my undergraduate program is partially in Chinese and, and partially in English. Am I required to take an English proficiency test? Uh, so for this anonymous attendee, it depends on, well, there are different regulations for different students, depending on where they are from. If you um, are an international student who took um, undergraduate or previous graduate study fully in English in a, an institution where English is a language of education, then you are not required to submit a TOEFL score or one of those standard recognized uh, English language scores. If, however, you are from Hong Kong, Macau, Macau or Taiwan, you do still have to submit one of the standardized English test scores. I'm not sure what you mean by partially in English and partially in Chinese. I think the best thing for you to do would be to send an email to yca-admissions at, at pku.edu.cn to get some more clarity on that. Um, and then finally, last thing I'll say about the HSK, um, you must have a valid completed HSK 6 passing grade with the certificate before you were able to place out of the Chinese as a second language courses. If you waited until you came to Beijing and say took the course in November of the fall of your first year, that would mean that you could only exempt out of Chinese as a second language courses in the spring semester of your, set, of your first year. Okay, let's move ahead. Um, so here are some of the recent thesis topics that our students have uh, completed um, in the economics and management track. And you can get a sense here just how broad um, economics and management can actually be, just how interdisciplinary it, your thesis still can be, even though it's defined as economics and management. So looking at executive pay and excess perks, behavioral economics approaches to understanding uh, benefit corporations, sustainable consumption behavior, supply chain finance, investment allocation, AIIB, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot that can be done within economics and management. And coming up, we'll have one alum uh, of Yanjing Academy who will share some of his experiences applying to um, going through the Yanjing Academy curriculum and writing and defending his master's thesis. So you'll get at least uh, a little bit um, 
at least one person's perspective on how it worked um, as a student at YCA. We have a couple of questions here. Can you have a thesis topic under two research areas, such as business and literature? And then someone else earlier asked, can I apply for both economics and management and culture and literature? So no, you cannot apply for two different research areas at Yanjing Academy. It must be literature and culture or economics and management. That's, you know, you can only have one of those listed in your application and on your um, diploma when you graduate. That having been said, you can certainly and you should be interdisciplinary in your research methodology in your thesis. Let's say your thesis is on, um, you're within economics and management and you wanna do a, let's say, look at um, historical and contemporary uh, industrial policy in the 20th century. So that, that's an interesting topic. That is, if you apply to economics and management, that is economics and management topic that is also heavily focusing on economic history. Now, conversely, depending on your training and your actual research interest, you could make that a history and archeology span project that is heavily focusing on economic history. That's up to you. So you need to think strategically about what you're trained in, what you're really interested in, and uh, pay attention to the faculty members that are advisors at Peking University and try to find someone whose work um, perhaps mirrors or will help train you to what you really want to do. Speaking of which, here is a, a list of some of the departments, schools, and institutes at Peking University that YCA faculty thesis advisors have been drawn from in the past. So you can see under economics and management, we have people from the Guanghua School of Management, the School of Economics, National School of Development, School of Education, a school of Psychological and Cognitive Sciences, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Advisors are absolutely key to any student's experience in a graduate program. We have a two advisor system. In the first year, it's an academic advisor. We hope that that academic advisor could become your thesis advisor, but you will choose your academic advisor one month after arriving on campus. And that's just not reasonable to expect a, a newly arrived student on PKU to be able to identify their thesis advisor within one month. So the faculty advisor for the first year is there to help sort of be your, um, your guide to interacting with and learning about the faculty and the academic environment at Peking University. They're there to learn about your developing research interests, to discuss your course selection with you, and as they learn more about your interest to suggest and introduce other faculty, member to you, faculty members to you. If you're interested in topic X, then maybe they know someone in a different department or school who works on that topic and then they can help point you in the right direction. So you can learn more about the faculty here. And by the end of your first year, um, as you submit your formal master's thesis proposal, you will also do so uh, when you submit a thesis advisor uh, selection as well. Here you can see some of the kinds of events that we send our students on in our fall field study course. In the first year, fall field study, or the first four years, fall field study went to Xi'an in Shanxi province. Uh, for the last several trips, we've been going to Chengdu and Sichuan province. We'll be heading to Chengdu in early November this year. Obviously, there have been some changes to the field study and to many of our courses um, since the COVID-19 pandemic um, spread around the world. And we, like many universities, have been um, online. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that situation at the end of my presentation. Um, to give you a little bit more information about elective courses, your core required courses are going to account for roughly 50% of your required, minimum required course credits in your first year. That's going to leave 50% uh, of your course credits uh, for electives. And in general, at the, at the graduate level, the master's level at Peking University, most of the courses are going to meet once a week um, for three hours, sometimes over maybe 10 weeks. Sometimes there will be um, 
let's say once a week for two hours over you know 15 weeks so most court most academic courses at the graduate level at peking university are going to be two course credits so that means you can generally take around seven eight or so uh, elective courses in your first year the spring study the springfield study this is part of the china in transition two where you break off into smaller classes led by a PKU faculty member, and they're going to be teaching you about an area of research that they are experts in. You join that course and under the guidance of that professor, design and carry out your own field research, one semester field research project. You can see in 17, 18, and 19, our students would go to um, 15 provinces, administrative regions, cities, et cetera, around China. Obviously for 2020, uh, we had to uh, drastically curtail, basically cancel that field research component. For 2021, um, a lot of it had to be done online because most international scholars are as of yet still unable to come to China. I'm gonna skip through some of these slides. These are some of the kinds of field studies and site visits in the spring semester course down in Guizhou province in southwestern China. Here's some uh, field study trips. This is our fall field study to Sichuan. Uh, we go to Chengdu and spend a little bit of time as well in Chongqing, or really on the outskirts of Chongqing. I'd like to highlight this gentleman here in the picture on the left. That's Professor Lu Yang from the Department of History at Peking University and the Director of Graduate Studies at Yanjing Academy. Professor Liu is an expert in um, um, Buddhism, uh, ancient and medieval Chinese history. Um, he did his undergraduate work at Peking University, some uh, grad work in uh, Germany, and then his PhD at Princeton University in the United States. He then taught at Princeton in the Department of History for 15 years before coming back to uh, PKU and joining the Engine Academy team. So I think his uh, academic experience um, rooted in Peking University and the Chinese educational system, uh, graduate study abroad, um, teaching at one of the best universities in the world in the United States, and then coming back to blend these educational experiences, I think is, is somewhat representative of what we're trying to do at the Engine Academy. Here's another field study trip, uh, some students going out to Dunhuang in the um, Gansu Corridor, a major entrepot uh, for the Old Silk Road, beautiful Buddhist grotto caves, uh, and embarrassingly, a place that I have still not yet visited, even though I've spent 14 out of the last 21 years here in China. The Engine Global Symposium is our flagship event. It is organized and run by Yanjing scholars, of course, with the support of Yanjing um, Academy staff and Yanjing Academy leadership. Students join the Yanjing Global Symposium team early in their first year. They design a theme. They identify and invite VIP keynote speakers. They put out a call for applications, receive thousands of applications for a hundred or more spots for young scholars. Um, and in a non-pandemic era, we then bring all of them over to Beijing for a long weekend of um, keynote speeches, research sharing, networking, um, brainstorming, et cetera. It's a really fantastic event. You can see our previous theme was shared renewal, recoupling East and West, both looking at um, the increasing tension um, and broadly defined the West and China's relationship, especially in the context of a soon to be post COVID world. Our colleagues in the student affairs office um, also provide career development and training. These include recruiting trips by companies and international organizations who come on campus specifically to recruit Yanjing scholars. Uh, finding leaders in different business fields or professional set settings to come over and share their experience and their um, wisdom after years or more working in individual fields. These are all voluntary activities, uh, but it's something that we provide to our students on a voluntary basis to enrich their overall experience here at Yanjing Academy. After graduation, 
Here you can see that in the economics and management track, um, we've recently had some people go on to further economics degrees, uh, some master's degrees, some PhDs, all at top universities around the world. In general, about 30% of the of Yanjing scholars annually go on to further graduate study. Now that's speaking about the entire student body. That's not data specific to economics and management. I would think that economics and management students have a lower percentage who go on to doctoral study or further graduate study, probably a higher percentage relative to the other research areas that go directly into um, their professional careers. Here are some of the um, organizations, institutions, and companies that Yanjin scholars have found gainful employment at after graduation. In general, our scholars, both uh, domestic mainland Chinese scholars and international scholars are very, very successful um, in taking the next step in their career, whether it be further graduate study, academic path, or perhaps uh, moving into the professional stage of their career. Overall, you can look at a sense of our student body and the seven cohorts that have joined us at Yanjing Academy. Over 750 scholars from over 80 different countries and regions. For your information, a 0.5 in, indicates dual citizenship. Over the seven cohorts of Yanjing scholars, you can see that we've had students join us from nearly 320 universities. Uh, these are the top 18 universities that, that have placed the highest number of students in the Yanjing Academy over the last seven years. So you can just look at that list and get a sense of the, um, you know, um, elite academic institutions that send students to our, uh, our program. This is interesting here, and this is another moment for me to, to share a little bit more about um, research areas. Um, you can see here that 32% um, of Yanjing scholars have chosen the economics and management research track. That's second only to politics and international relations, which has 36%. Uh, law and society is roughly around 15%, and then the humanities make up about 20% um, of the areas that Yanjing scholars have chosen. We do not have quotas for um, research areas. This is just what Yanjing scholars have, the most competitive Yanjing scholars have wanted to choose in their application process. So there, we're not looking for exactly 20% per, or pardon me, exactly you know, 15, 16% per research area. We're not looking for such an unbalanced, nor are we looking for such an unbalanced, you know, 70% going to economics and management and politics and international relations and only 20% to the humanities. So you should apply for what you are A, interested in and B, or maybe, you know, B, what you are trained in. For 2021, we had 96 scholars from 34 different countries and regions, uh, and you can get a sense of, of their uh, regional, not so much national, but their regional breakdown um, for the 2021 seventh cohort of Yanjing scholars. This is a lower intake of scholars, a smaller intake of scholars than we normally target, but this was expected because of COVID-19 and the uncertainties uh, surrounding continued travel restrictions for international students to China. We also don't really mind having a smaller cohort in 2021 because once the borders do reopen to international students, we're confident that almost all of them that are able to are gonna to wanna to come. And so this gives us a little bit more administrative space to uh, take care of those students that we already have in the program when they do want to come to Beijing, when they're able to come to Beijing. In 2021, we had scholars from 83 different universities, uh, and you can get a sense of the universities that place the highest number of students at the Yanjing Academy in our uh, 2021 intake of Yanjing scholars. And in 2021, the stats for the selection of research areas is more or less the same. Um, you know, politics and international relations remains one, law, 
economics and management re remains two, law and society is remains three. That that's the same over the, the years, but had a little bit of an increase in law and society. More literature and culture this year than than I have seen over the last couple of years. Again, there is no quota for uh, we don't have a target for the number of students uh, or the percentage of students in an individual research area. Nor do we have quotas for people from uh, not for national origin or uh, continent or regional origin as well. This can give you a little bit of sense of uh, the highest level of education attained by Yanjing scholars upon their entry to Yanjing Academy. So uh, in general, we tend to have more um, bachelor's degree students, uh, but we always do have a significant number of um, those with a previous master's degree upon entering YCA. This is skewed a little bit because uh, students from mainland China are only able to apply to Yanjing Academy if they went to a university on the Chinese mainland and they are eligible to apply through what's called the Tuinian system, uh, the re recommendation to avoid, recommendation to not take the um, graduate entrance examination. So all mainland Chinese scholars, which are generally about roughly 25 a year, give or take, can only join us directly out of their undergraduate um, program. Okay, let's talk about application strategies, what we're looking for. You know, we're fully funded. We are highly uh, competitive graduate program in China studies at Peking University. So an outstanding academic record is a given. That's not all we're looking for, but that's the starting point. Now, I'm not going to go into any details about, you know, what is a minimum GPA, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> you know, if I got an A minus on a certain course, can I not get in? That, that's not the, the level of detail that I think is appropriate to discuss today. Uh, but you need an outstanding academic record. But we look for more than that. If there are extracurricular activities that are important to you, uh, to your undergraduate or previous learning experience, to who you are as a person, like um, community service, athletics, art, music, uh, have you started your own company, you know, model United Nations, debate, et cetera, et cetera. The, if these are important to who you are as an individual and as a developing young professional and young scholar, we want to know about that. And we value excellence and engagement in those kinds of activities. It's very important that you either have experience in or can demonstrate sustained commitment to cultural diversity because we are a very culturally diverse student body, not just you know, international students coming and learning about China, but from all over the world, different languages, religions, cultures, backgrounds. We are a graduate program academically focused on China studies. So previous interest, training in, uh, experience in, et cetera, China studies broadly defined is a competitive advantage. It is not a requirement. Every year we have a, a not insignificant number of students who excelled in one area and at this point in their academic or their professional careers realize to go where they need to go, they, they need to know China better. And so they decide to make this move into China studies at this stage at the master's degree level. That's okay too. You can still write a very compelling um, application profile if you have no previous China studies experience. Of course, you'll need to play up your other experiences and let us know why now. Why China? Why YCA? Why now? That rationale for why you want to apply to Yanjing Academy specifically and how it will help you achieve your long-term career goals is also um, something you should include in your applications. You know, this is same to applying to any graduate program or really any job. You need to tell us what you can bring to the table, and you need to tell us what you hope to contribute to our program and what you hope to take away from it as you move into the next stage of your career. And English proficiency is also a requirement of the program. Um, we have a student who asked that they took an English taught class in your current university, but just attended the lecture and there is no credit. Uh, that will not be acceptable. Um, 
you know, you can ask specifically, uh, email us, I'll sh share an email coming up soon. <clears throat> you can ask specifically about your um, previous institution of higher education, if that will qualify for you, avoiding the English uh, language proficiency test. Um, but mm, unless it is a university or sometimes colleges within universities that are fully taught in English, the answer is most likely going to be no, you still need to submit your standardized uh, test for English language proficiency. Okay. If you are on this meeting um, and you are from the Chinese mainland, your only opportunity to apply to Yanjing Academy, unfortunately, is if you attended, if you are currently attending an undergraduate institution in the Chinese mainland and you qualify for Tui Nian Zige, the uh, recommendations to enter graduate school without taking the, the graduate placement examination. If you are a Chinese citizen and did your um, undergraduate work abroad, unfortunately, to this point, uh, we are not allowed to accept, or not allowed to admit PRC citizens who did their uh, undergraduate study abroad. We have some proposals that are being reviewed about that. We would very much like to um, allow PRC citizens who did their studies, undergraduate studies abroad to apply to Yanjing Academy, but that has not been approved yet. So that door is not yet open. If you are from Hong Kong, Macau, or Taiwan, uh, there is another administrative process you need to go through in the application procedure. You need to apply to Yanjing Academy just like everyone else does, but there's also a special application portal on PKU's website that you will need to apply for as well. It more or less repeats most of the application documents, but not all of them. Some of it has to be done in Chinese, et cetera. So this is a um, more complicated process. It's sort of like a, a repeating of the application process to a different portal on Peking University's website. If you fit this profile, if you are from Hong Kong, Macau, or Taiwan, you must go to our website, go to the admissions drop-down tab and check on the detailed information for applicants from Hong Kong, Macau, or Taiwan. Please do not miss this. The minimum requirement for being eligible to apply to Yanjing Academy is completing a bachelor's degree that will be completed no later than August 31st, 2022. This is a master's program. You can't enter a master's program without already having graduated with your bachelor's. So application requirements. Um, the application deadline for um, applicants who are not applying from partner universities is December 3rd, 2021. Friday, December 3rd, 2021, noon, Beijing time. Please make sure you're aware that all of our deadlines are Beijing time and be sure to check the time difference between Beijing and where you are. You fill everything out at yanjingacademy.pku.edu.cn. We have a, a, an admissions portal there on our website. You will need a certificate of English proficiency, IELTS, TOEFL, Cambridge, etc. For those whose native language is not English, and um, for those who did not attend, or including perhaps um, students, applicants from Hong Kong, Macau, and Taiwan, even if they attended a university that was taught in English. We will need diplomas from all institutions of higher education that you've attended. Now, we understand that if you're applying as a fourth year undergraduate student, you won't be getting your diploma until early fall. Uh, so roughly after you've already arrived in Beijing. Uh, for Yanjing Academy. We understand that. But we will need, um, when you apply, we'll need a um, certificate of enrollment. Um, we will also need your official academic transcripts, official transcripts from your bachelor's program and or other master's programs if you have attended those. We need a personal statement in English up to 750 words. This is sort of you telling us who you are, what you can bring to our program, 
why you're interested in studying at Yanjing Academy, what your career plans are, and how YCA can help you achieve those goals. It is your formal, personal introduction to the Yanjing Academy. We also require a statement of research interest. This is a maximum of 1500 words excluding citations. This is your formal academic introduction to Yanjing Academy. You are to tell us what you think you are going to uh, research, what you hope to research for your master's thesis. You are not required to actually have your master's thesis be exactly what you've written in your statement of research interest. Last year, this was called a research proposal, and it was shorter. But we, we added more length to this, to this requirement, and we also um, wanted to redefine what we're looking for. You know, if you already have a firmly set topic for your master's thesis and can write us a formal academic research proposal, the statement of the problem, uh, literature review, research questions, and likely contribution, great, we're happy to see that. That would be wonderful. But you also don't, because we don't expect you to know exactly what you want to research yet, what we, we don't require a full formal research proposal. But what we do require is formal language, an academic proposal, an academic paper. I highly suggest that it, your uh, definition of the problem or topic you're interested in researching and the reason for doing it and the methodology should be grounded in secondary academic literature. This is an academic graduate program. Uh, you should not be writing a research proposal that does not ground itself in academic literature. Okay, so it's a statement of research interest that is formal, academic, and includes literature review. We'll need to see your resume and CV, resume or CV. And this is very important for letters of recommendation. Um, they must be two academic letters of recommendation and per Peking University regulations, they must be from associate professors or full professors or their equivalent. Unfortunately, assistant professors do not qualify uh, per PKU regulations. And this is not just Peking University, this is the standard for academic graduate programs in China. Um, so that's something that you need to pay attention to. If you have someone who is, say, um, an assistant professor or a lecturer or a research mentor from an internship who wants to write you a letter, they can, but it cannot fulfill the two academic letters of recommendation requirement. It must be submitted as an additional document. Um, so for um, a question on citations in the um, research proposal, uh, it doesn't matter which, which form of citation you use, just use one of the standard professionally accepted citations, uh, APA, Chicago Manual, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Either one is fine, but it does need to uh, be formally cited. And then um, there is one, let's see, God, we got a lot of questions in here. Okay, um, that's the admissions, the uh, admissions requirements. If you have more questions, or even if you don't have more questions, go to our website, yanjingacademy.pku.edu.cn. Look at the application materials. Um, get us, you know, do your, prepare yourself, do your work before you apply. Look at our requirements. Look at the courses. Look at the profiles of previous and current Yanjing scholars. Very, very important. Look at the profiles of previous and current Yanjing scholars, and you'll get a sense of the kinds of um, you'll get a sense of the kinds of diversity, both professionally and academically, that people can see. Uh, the diversity of incoming Yanjing scholars. Very, very helpful to see what people who've successfully made it into the program uh, had been doing before, what they're researching here, and what they want to do moving forward into the future. If you have any direct questions, please contact us at yca-admissions at pku.edu.cn. If you use WeChat, feel, please feel free to scan the QR code in the bottom left and follow our uh, the Engine Academy official WeChat account to get a good sense of, of what's going on 
uh, with our community and on our campus. Um, okay, James is back. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, mute and stop my video. James, uh, thanks for joining us and sharing your experience. Sure, if you wouldn't mind just re-enabling my video uh, while I'm getting into this, I'll, I'll start with the introduction. So thank you guys for your patience. Um, my name is James Ashcroft. I'm a dual UK US citizen uh, and a member of the first cohort of the Enching Academy. So just very brief self-introduction here. I studied history for my undergraduate at UCL at University College London, and then pursued the MA China Studies degree uh, here in Beijing at, at Peking University, where I read economics and management, which is why I'm here with you today. In terms of extracurriculars, I'll skip over the UCL ones. At uh, YCA, I was the co-founder and director of logistics for the Yenching Global Symposium, which Dr. Haas mentioned earlier in this presentation. And in terms of work experience, I returned to London straight after Yenching to take up a role at Deloitte as a management consultant, spent a couple of years there, and then returned to Beijing in uh, 2018, actually to attend the IUP program at Tsinghua um, when Dr. Haas indeed was still the resident director there. Since then, I've worked as a manager at TikTok here in Beijing at ByteDance in the commercialization and market analysis team. And now I work as a manager at a tech startup uh, in the city uh, at a company called App in China that helps overseas companies to publish and monetize their software locally. So moving on to uh, the next slide, I'll share a little bit about my motivation and also my experience um, on this program. So motivation wise, I would probably fall into the category of someone with less China experience when I, uh, when I first enrolled. Um, at UCL, I attended a couple um, courses in my second year and in my third year on ancient and medieval Chinese history. And that was really my entry point into uh, an interest in China. Uh, but certainly by, when I arrived, I had never studied a word of Chinese. Uh, I hadn't had any kind of extensive research engagement with China. And in this respect, the program has certainly changed. Dr. Haas has uh, emphasized throughout this, um, uh, there we go, there's a video, uh, throughout this presentation, uh, that this is a, a program of serious uh, academic graduate level study. That of course was ostensibly true in my first year here back in 2015, but that year at Yenching felt a little bit more entrepreneurial, a little bit more like a startup. We didn't, for instance, need to prepare a research proposal uh, in order to apply, just the, the personal statement. And some of these academic aspects of the program have definitely matured and grown uh, since I left. I did feel when I applied to Yenching uh, that it was important to experience and attempt to better understand this country, which is already so important and is only going to become more important in the course of our lifetimes. Um, but I didn't really have very much more, um, you know, to, perspective on China to share prior to that. It, it was a little bit of a, a leap into the unknown. I grew up in three different countries in, in France and in, in the US and the United Kingdom, but I'd never been to Asia. Uh, I'd never been to China. So when I stepped off that plane in August of 2015, um, it was a very new experience for me. And that experience was very much conditioned too by the fact that I knew that at the end of the year, I would be leaving. I already had the job lined up at Deloitte in London and they had kindly allowed me to defer by one year in order to participate in the program. It wasn't really until the two years that I was back in London that I had this kind of gnawing sense that I hadn't quite achieved uh, or experienced everything that I wanted to in China. Um, there was undoubtedly an aspect of having had this transformational year, undoubtedly the best year of my life, and seeing from afar, you know, still being in all of these WeChat groups with friends who stayed for that second year. Uh, and, you know, I, I realized that there were some things that I was missing out on. Um, we'll come back to that point uh, in a little bit, because I think actually to have gone back to London when I did, did enable me to do uh, certain things in China since then that I might not have been able to do if I just stayed the entire time. In terms of the experience of Yenching itself, um, you know, it's pretty clear here. It was an unforgettable introduction to China. It was a truly phenomenal year surrounded by the smartest, most diverse, most interesting uh, group of classmates I'd ever 
been, you know, the, had the privilege of, of studying with. And many of them are now lifelong friends. Uh, I do have several very close friends from my time at UCL as an undergraduate. But when I look back over the last 10 years uh, since turning 18, the vast majority of my really, truly close friends were made at Yenching, um, one or two also at Tsinghua at, uh, at the IUP program. But to be a part of this community is very special because if you are in that second year at Yenching, or if you choose to continue your, your career in China beyond that, as I've done, every year, at least under non-COVID circumstances, you know, you, you have an in with 100, 200 phenomenally interesting people from all over the world who you can connect with. It's a wonderfully vibrant and diverse community. And actually the screenshot or the, the slide that Dr. Haas shared earlier about the nearly 800 uh, Yenching scholars from over 80 countries uh, that we now have, I, I screenshotted that and sent it to the, the Yenching 2015 group. It's kind of mind boggling to see it, to be honest, because when we joined in 2015, when we applied in 2014, there was no guarantee that, that Yenching was gonna you know, last uh, beyond three years, four years, five years. I mean, these were things we talked about back then. There was no track record. When I applied, the buildings weren't built. There were no alumni to speak to. There was no curriculum published. I mean, it really was a leap into the unknown and it's a remarkable and very satisfying thing to see us still going so strong, uh, you know, especially under these very difficult conditions now with COVID um, seven, eight years later. And you know, I, I hope that there are some people on the on the call right now who will be able to be a part of that next cohort and and take that step and experience this journey that that I and so many others have now shared. On the point of the invaluable network and the what I've described as the the unique cachet in China circles, I think this is really important to understand. I had not been to China before. I did not have a lot of China experience prior to coming to Yenching. I didn't know what Peking University was. Of course, I knew it was a university. Of course, I knew it was in China. But it wasn't until I arrived and really in the years since that I've come to appreciate quite what a special place Peking University is and what it means to Chinese people. I'll share a very brief anecdote. When I was here in the, that first summer, I was walking around Weiming Lake, uh, which you've seen some pictures of today. And there, because it was the holidays, there were some tourists on campus. There were parents with children as young as three or four or five. And the parents were pointing at things like, you know, the lake, the tower, the famous sites on Peking University's campus, the Westgate. This is what you want. That was the message from the parents. That really helped me to understand what a big deal this was. In the United Kingdom, in the United States, where, where I grew up, Peking University is not a big deal. Um, it, it is becoming more of a big deal, and that is likely to increase in the course of our lifetimes. But you need to understand how important Peking University is in the intellectual traditions and in the culture of modern China. When you apply for a job, oftentimes you need to complete a form, right? Peking the Yenching Academy of Peking University often is its own dropdown on that list. I think that speaks volumes of the importance of this program and the esteem, or the, the high regard um, in which it's held. That was true when I applied to TikTok. That was true when I applied to several other companies. Um, you know, for such a young program to be named in a drop-down menu like that is really remarkable. Being a graduate of Peking University and being a Yenching scholar in and of itself will, op will open incredible opportunities for you in China and in China-related roles all over the world. So, you know, please, please don't underestimate that uh, when you're assessing the value of this potential opportunity. My suggestions to you as prospective students. Dr. Haas has already covered this, but I, I think it's it, it bears repeating because it's very important. In your personal statement and in your interview, should you receive one, be very clear on what your interest in China is and how you believe the receipt of this scholarship will enable you to achieve those things. It's really, really important. People come to Yenching from a variety of backgrounds and at different stages in their career. I was much younger when I was at Yenching. I had turned 22 just before the opening ceremony. But what Yenching wants to see is how do we as a group, how does this scholarship fit into the narrative 
and the plans that you imagine for yourself. It's a very generous scholarship and the organizers and the administrators of those funds want to make sure that they are contributing to helping people realize uh, you know, sincere and impactful uh, China-related careers. Second, you should really focus on considering what value you'll add to the community of Yanqing scholars. Dr. Haas has alluded to it, and I have alluded to it, but I will emphasize here, the single best thing about this program are the people. It is a truly remarkable community. And you should be very clear in your mind about not only what you will gain from being a part of that community, but also what you seek to contribute to it. That's something that is, uh, is very important. Dr. Haas also alluded to the sheer breadth of topics covered um, at the thesis level. Mine is no exception. I wrote about the Chinese football reform and development program um, from an economics and management perspective. It's a, you do really have quite wide reign at, at, at Yancheng to pursue uh, your academics interests. It has changed somewhat, <clears throat> admittedly, since my time, not least because of course, uh, you know, I'm not sure that I would have been admitted to the economics and management track with my undergraduate background had I applied under, you know, with the current guidelines. But nevertheless, uh, it is a fantastically wide ranging introduction to China that emphasizes interdisciplinarity in a way that has not yet filtered down um, to undergraduate education in this country. I've often described Yancheng, and I still feel that it represents something of a special academic zone. You know, a bit of a play on uh, Deng Xiaoping's um, special economic zones. It's a great place to explore and be creative and try new things and interact with people from backgrounds, both um, you know, national and, and academic, very different perhaps to your own. So with that, I will pause. And I think we should probably try to use as much of what time will be permitted to us uh, now um, to handle some, some questions. Um, so I'll stop sharing the screen uh, and hand back over to uh, Dr. Haas, and perhaps we can take a look at some, some of the questions that people might have.